Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Fraud Horror Stories, Lessons Learned from Finance Pros on Fraud Risks and con Internal Controls. Um, I'm just changing the chat so you guys can chat with everyone here. Um, as we wait for everyone to join over the next few minutes, please feel free to join into the chat, share where you're joining from. I'm Devin Clark. I'm Santin's Director of Demand Generation, and I am joining you today from Boston, Massachusetts. Looks like we have people from Denver, Florida, Ohio, so thank you so much for sharing where you're joining from. Before we get started into the meat of the content, I just want to go over a few housekeeping notes. So we are recording. Um, if you're curious to go back and re-watch this webinar, we'll send you the on-demand recording via email. Secondly, please engage with the polls. I'm about to start our first poll out of four. Um, so make sure to engage in those. It really helps our speakers today um, really understand who you are and guides the conversation. Additionally, if you did sign up through CPA Academy, you are required to answer the poll questions, at least three of them. And then lastly, again, I see a lot of you joining already on chat. So please chat away in there. If you have any questions for our um, speakers today, we have Don and BC. There is a Q&A interface within Zoom. So check that out and you can ask us any questions that you have. So with that, um, today we have BC Krishna, CEO and founder of San Team, And we also have Dawn Brolin, who is the CEO of Powerful Accounting. And I know she is a very popular presence for our CPA Academy attendees that are joining us today. BC, do you wanna share a little bit about yourself and really why you're so um, geared to speak to us today about financial fraud? Thank you. Yeah. And uh, thank you for uh, for that, Don. Um, it's a privilege and an and honor to be, uh, um, you know, co-hosting this webinar with you. Look forward to riffing for the next uh, hour or so on this topic that <laughs> always gets lots of attention. Um, and it's perverse, right? I mean, you know, in some ways we all like to, 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 to see car crashes, I think. Um, but in this particular <laughs> in this particular case, I think what we want to do is to not only talk about how um, what the crashes are, but also how we can avoid being in one ourselves. Um, I am BC Krishna, I'm the founder and CEO of Santim. But you know, prior to this, in a prior life, um, you know, uh, I started a company called Memento, which was a fraud detection company. Um, our calling card was employee fraud, and we sold software to banks. Uh, you know, that basically used it to try to mitigate the risk of of employee fraud. I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot about what happens and, and all the confidence tricks that fraudsters play. Um, and, uh, you know, want to share some of those stories. And indeed, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have done or have done since then is to try to incorporate, you know, those kinds of controls into the solutions that, you know, my, my company provides, you know. Um, before I turn it over to you, Don, I just wanted to say one thing that I promise you I will not talk about Frank Abagnale and catch me if you can. Um, <laughs> it's it's a hacky old story. And of course, if you want to know what that is and you haven't heard about it already, watch the movie. Uh, but there's plenty of other things to talk about. And in particular, as it relates to uh, business related company, um, issues. Sorry to have gone long, but over to you, Don. You did great. No, that was great, BC. Uh, yeah, Frank, you know, you should watch the movie. It's Leonardo DiCaprio, DiCaprio and he's just hot. So for those of you <laughs> who like him, it makes it, it just makes it, it's not hard on your eyes when you watch the movie. But um, yeah, so my name is Dawn Brolin. I'm a CPA, certified fraud examiner. I've been speaking for CPA Academy for many years. It's, it's a great platform for us all to jump on and learn. And, you know, as a certified fraud examiner, it just really upsets me when I get a phone call from a referral where there's been an embezzlement, there's been theft. And the thing that I think bothers me the most about it is those people who are being embezzled from or stolen from have really worked their tail off their entire life, I'm sure, to build some kind of a business. And they're trusting people. And we're going to talk a little bit about how important trust is. But um, it breaks my heart, to be it, to be totally honest. And so anytime that we can help minimize the risk of, of an embezzlement or a fraud, whatever capacity it may be, if we can minimize that risk or almost eliminate it, which it's hard to eliminate it, but 
minimizing is critical, then I am all about it. And so I'm honored to be here. I, I am the CEO of Powerful Accounting. I'm also the designated motivator. I wrote a book about the designated motivator because I just want people to thrive in their lives and have better lives and give back to other people. And I and if I can help one person make one simple change today that minimizes the risk or eliminates the fact that someone would be stolen from, then it's worth every moment of my time here. And at BC, thank you so much for, for having me on today. I'm excited about this topic. Topic. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't say it better. I think that, you know, if we can have one person think about better controls, I think we'll be successful. Yes. Uh, you know, today. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Don, we're so thankful to have you here with us today. So with that, I'm just going to quickly go over the agenda for what you guys can expect from us today. So we'll be sharing some real life scenarios of financial fraud, the importance of robust internal controls, some proactive measures that you can take to mitigate fraud risk today. And then towards the end of the session, we'll have an open Q&A. Um, and with that, BC, I'm going to stop sharing so you can dive into the meat of the content today. All right. So the exercise in sharing my screen, hopefully. You're doing great. <laughs> I'm going to give a clap for the switch <laughs> off here. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I think that, you know, like I said, you know, the, there are cons, these are these attempts to defraud us are relentless, right? They're constantly happening. Uh, personal story, my dad passed away some years ago, but in the last few years of his life, uh, unfortunately, he fell victim to uh, a lottery scheme. And, you know, no matter how hard you try and like, you know, I mean, here I am like completely aware of things, telling my dad not to do these, like engage in these horrible conversations. And yet, you know, it's relentless at some point or the other, you know, they break through the defenses. So I think it's important for us to just really recognize, number one, that our social systems really function on the basis of trust, not to wax philosophical, um, but I think it's really important for us to recognize that trust is what makes society function, right? Trust in fellow human beings. But the problem I think is that bad actors, you know, basically exploit that trust. And that's really what the essence of this kind of, you know, these schemes are, right? And so the question for us always is, how do we preserve and extend our social systems and our business practices, right? Uh, which are based on trust, which are based on sort of, you know, good actors while protecting ourselves from bad actors. And so I want to talk about like three or four things that actually are more structural in nature that we need to become aware of. But that awareness is what allows us to proceed to the next step because without that awareness, you know, I don't think that, you know, we'll have the context within which we can sort of look at the controls we need to have in place. And I know you have some 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 thoughts about this, Don. So please feel free to jump in, you know, as we go through this. Absolutely. Like I said, number one is that our attitudes, like trust and fundamental structural issues, which I'll talk, go into, often keep us from managing fraud risk more effectively. We do it here, we do it there, but generally speaking, I think there are so many kind of fundamental structural issues that I think we need to we need to really address. I want to start with the apocryphal story of the boiling frog phenomenon. I know many of you have heard about it, uh, but let me just once again repeat that the story goes thusly, right? That you take a frog and you drop it into a pan of hot water and it jumps out immediately, right? Um, but the uh, but the other uh, side of it, again, it's apocryphal. I don't think any frogs were destroyed in this experiment uh, and nobody has actually done it. <laughs> Uh, but but the uh, the uh, the 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 way it goes is that you take a pan of cold water, you drop a frog into it, and you slowly heat it up, and the poor frog never detects that the 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 the, the water is getting hot and it basically explodes. Um, so this is essentially kind of you know socially this is how we feel because of that trust we tend to be in denial. It hasn't happened to me. It won't happen to me. Everything is fine. I can cross the street in traffic and I won't be hit by it. Right. This is sort of sometimes like what we how we function, but that denial you know essentially creates increasing risk exposure. Right. And and you can see almost like you know whether it's like you know stories in the in the stories in the news about SBF uh, I mean you know Sam Bankman Fried or others and you see this thing over and over and over again where denial there's rising exp risk exposure there's some kind of explosive loss right boiling frog then eventually what happens is that we get into crisis management. Right. Yeah, one of the things key about that BC that is so the best part about it is it is preventable. 
but it, it is so often that we overlook the things that are most important because we're just carrying on with our day. Imagine just driving a car. You know, you expect to get into your car and you expect to push the gas and you expect the car to go. And until you forget to look at the gas gauge when you're in the middle of a highway and all of a sudden you run out of gas, you're like, now I should pay attention to the gas gauge. Well, it's a little too late. And that's like a kind of a simple, dumbed down example. But that's it. We we well, we can we can manage the crisis. We know we can manage it. But why do we even get ourselves to that point? And that's, exactly. You know. And to extend that analogy, we are tuned in our brains to think about that gas gauge when we get into the car. But when it comes to business practices and things like payments, we're not aware enough of the issues. And so we don't think about it, right? And right. part of the goal today is to just simply make us aware of the fact that these things happen, but there's a handful of simple controls that we can use to actually mitigate that risk, just like looking at the gas gauge. Yeah. So this is one point, right? We tend to um, minimize the risk because we're simply not aware. The second is, this is a really interesting one, right? Um, what happens is that, you know, uh, there's always like, you know, some latent risk in the background. And as the risk, um, you know, rises, right, we become aware of it. And uh, basically what happens is that then people start to put in place controls to mitigate that risk. Those controls have costs. It may be software costs. It may be user experience costs. It may be process costs, whatever they are. There are some costs. But once you become aware of it and you start to like put those controls in place, eventually those risks do go down. And then they get to the point where actually your controls cost you more than the losses that you're taking, <laughs> right? And that's yes. where like, you know, it's a paradox, right? It's like the only business I know where success has a negative ROI. You yeah. know, and, and and so, but the point is that when you're in this kind of yield curve where like your cost of control is greater than the 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 risk that's associated with it, the, the fraud, that's when there's a temptation to mitigate those, uh, the, uh, to remove those controls. And that's really important for us all to recognize that because there is no loss doesn't mean there is no risk. Well, right? and you know, it's interesting too, BC, because if you think back over the course of how business has evolved over time, and and we all know, there's so many small businesses out there that depend upon that the you know their business and the and the fruit from their tree to survive. But what we what we hadn't seen many many years ago, the cost of that control and minimizing the risks were really high for small business, and it wasn't really a conversation we could have. It was the big the big companies that had internal control. They had their own internal control division, and they focused. And that was you know they had 10, 15 employees that just focused on that. And that's a high, high cost that a small business just couldn't afford. But over the course, I'd say the last decade, maybe even a little bit longer than that, where the cost associated with minimizing the risk and having that those controls in place is now everyone can participate and everyone has access to it. We just have to let them know about it. That's exactly. the key. Exactly, exactly. Point number three I want to make is that, you know, there's it's kind of unequal, right? I mean, like when we think about like, let's put ourselves in the shoes of a fraudster, right? What a fraudster is really trying to do is to build a business. You know, they're investing in their schemes, right? For them, it's like, hey, it's a business. I'm thinking about growth. I'm thinking about strategy. You know, all of the new schemes that they're coming up with is like is being innovation. You know, all of that gives them money and power. And this is where like, you know, why fraud and control are really unequal, right? For them, it's all about driving revenue. And for us, it's all about mitigating cost. And so that's what sort of the other insidious thing about these schemes is that, you know, we're just like trying to minimize the cost of control, whereas what they're trying to do is to grow the size of their business. And as business people, we know that you would invest, you know, in growing your business. And so it's a kind of an, um, a really odd kind of scheme, right? Where, you know, we, and again, all I'm trying to do is to make us aware of the fact that this is how they think about it, of course. Uh, and we just need to like sort of recognize this. Absolutely. And then finally, like, you know, really, can we do better, right? I mean, I'll stop here, but, you know, we have slow reaction times. We don't think of value associated with control, and we don't necessarily innovate when it comes to things like fraud. And I think we really do need to look at these three issues um, as we move forward and kind of do a better job of um, ensuring that we create that balance, like I said, of trusting each other, trusting society, trusting the our mores, while at the same time ensuring that we don't fall victim to bad actors.
Yeah, a hundred percent. And of course, I mean, people on this on this call here today, I'm sure, are very aware. This reminded me of one of the points I wanted to make. One of my most passionate points that I like to make that I think will resonate. We've got the, the this three-legged chair we have in front of us here, the slow reaction times, the perception of value and the choke down innovation. We have these, it's the same exact thing as a as the fraud triangle. At the end yep. of the day, the way we can bring into the conversation, again, that I think about considering when I'm having conversations with my clients, that triangle, we lose one or the legs on a, on a three-legged chair, you lose one of those legs and it's over right? You, you, you're not sitting in that chair anymore. You don't sit on a two-legged stool, right? So with that fraud triangle, having that pressure, there's two parts of that fraud triangle. We can't, we can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about the pressure that an individual may be under, okay? So we, we, we can't control that because we don't control them as humans, as people. We can only control, again, the systems, so we have the pressure, we have the rationalization. Again, I cannot, I cannot help the way someone thinks, the way they consider and rationalize why they're actually stealing, why they're embezzling, whatever it is that they're doing, we can't, we can't deal with the, the rationalization part because that's just their mental state. We can't do anything. The only thing we can control is the third part of that three-legged stool, and that is opportunity. If we can minimize or eliminate in some ways, eliminate that opportunity. That's where internal controls come into play. That's where we can cause an effect and where we can make a difference. And I think that that's the message. Like, And I know for myself as, as a, an accountant, a trusted advisor to my clients, that's my job, right? So we can, we can go ahead and and make take those steps and have those conversations to say, hey, listen, Mark and Cody, I don't want you guys to ever have any of your employees embezzle from you. So we need to make sure we have good internal controls. You're not handing out your debit card to your drivers. What do you mean that happened to a client? They were like, yeah, we they just have they just have debit cards. I'm like, are you what what? Like who gives out the, you know, I get a credit card, but not a debit card. And there's, we have some other stories too, but anyway, that's where we can have these conversations with clients and people that are, again, this whole trust factor, we got to be looking out for them. And that fraud triangle, the only one we can affect is opportunity. Who's Mark? Who, who are Mark and Cody? Mark and their clients of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm like, what? You have, a, they have debit cards. I like freaked out. And so we had to, we had to implement the internal control. And I talked to all my clients about it because you know what? Without your cash, you are not in business. So if somebody is stealing your cash, what are you going to do? Right? Yeah, yeah, Jane, that's a great point. I love it. Educating your people. Absolutely. And, you know, you bring up some points, which we will talk about later as well. You know, we other the other thing that we sometimes sort of, you know, feel like, you know, we're, we're protected is, hey, you know, regulations, um, you know, uh, bank best practices, uh, you know, uh, you know, even if I lose, like, you know, with a credit card, you use the example of credit card, right? By yeah. law, you know, a typical Visa, MasterCard, American Express credit card, you know, you're only liable to the tune of 50 bucks, right? But with a debit card, doesn't apply. You know, nope. money comes out of your account, it's done. Similarly, I think that we tend to have a view as to what you're liable for and what the bank will protect you against in situations like your business accounts. We'll talk about that too in a second. But I think you're you're 100% I want to reinforce what you just said. What do we control? My mom always said, focus on what you can control. As you said, I can't control the mind of the fraudster. What I can control is my environment. What I can control is the controls that I have in place that mitigate that opportunity, that mitigate the risk and, and eliminate that opportunity or reduce that opportunity. Yep, so that said, I know we promised horror stories. And so what I wanted to do, I put together, Don, a few horror stories that I thought we would riff on. Yep. Um, and then not to really kind of focus on the horror part of the story, but maybe what we can also do is to talk about like, how, how could we have, how could this particular organization that was victimized have prevented it, right? right? Yep. And it comes back to the same thing. It always starts small, always grows. There's some kind of explosive loss. And then there's some, you know, kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, crisis management. Right. Right. And actually, you know, you've been doing this for, for, the, for, for your entire life. 
And it seems to me that it always comes back to two or three really simple controls. Yeah, they are, yeah, these are a rocket sign. We're not we're not trying to sell rockets here, or, or you know, send anyone to the next plant that we don't even know about yet. We're exactly. just trying to take simple processes to implement. And I always say, put your mask on first. Like for me, you know, I've I've got my system because you know what, I'm going to protect every penny and every unit if I maybe have inventory, uh, because that's I've sacrificed my entire life to help my to, to, to satisfy and can take care of my family and there's just no way i'm going to let anybody take that from me so let's get and into bc it. bc dom before you dive in i'm just going to let the audience know that we're about to launch the third poll okay. um so please answer that when you can thank you yeah so let's get into it so basically i think as we said like you know when it comes we're, we're really focused today on um, the business environment, right? Companies, AP controls, financial controls in a business. Obviously, the place where the greatest list risks lie are the associated with the processes associated with disbursement of cash, right? And one of the important processes is accounts payable. And you know uh, what we wanted to do is to really kind of take take through take us through a few stories relating to how. AP controls, lack of AP controls have really failed businesses. There's some other stories we'll talk about, just you know, make sure that we create more awareness. But let's start here, right? Uh, this is October 20th, 2023. This week, um, you know, or, or last week, uh, in the last seven days, you know, uh, those of you that are in the Boston area may know the Boston Center of Adult Education. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a hundred year old organization, a very you know, ancient organization, very well respected, provides lots of really fun courses for the community in Cambridge and Boston. Um, and, you know, good old Susan Brown, um, you know, uh, and her uh, employee, marketing employee, Karen Calfian, uh, together uh, over the course uh, of several years, about nine years or so, now uh, took the organization for $565,000. The sad yeah. part of this, you know, is is that, you know, it's, it's yes, there was a huge loss. Uh, but the problem, I think, is that the impact of that loss is now felt in the courses that they're unable to offer because they don't have the money to do it. So ultimately, it's a nonprofit, and ultimately, the um, you know the community loses from it. So the impact is so much more than just the organization. Yeah, and co-conspiracy that that type of a situation is very dangerous. And as we think about setting up in authorizations and approval processes and all of that, you still even that process alone. If Karen and um, Susan, if even if they had that process and. The board said, oh, great, they've got this process. There's all these, you know, safeguards in place. This is great. They're not in that day to day. So when you have two people who are probably possibly, and I don't, I don't know the structure of this business and whatsoever, but thinking about being a co-conspirator, that is such a dangerous situation because you've got one person like, I'll get this invoice in here. You're doing the accounting. You go ahead and add the vendor. We're going to do this and we're going to work together on it. Um, who knows what level of permissions each of those people had, how many permissions they likely overrided. So it's not even just BC. It's not just the, even the bigger conversation is even when those things are in place, they still have to be monitored. Exactly. It still has to exactly. be monitored. Exactly. So there's control and there's monitoring, right? Yes. Two things. And so I'll I'll say that I, again. We again, all we have in front of us is the is the report from the Boston Globe. But I think of two or three things that could and should have been done here. Number one is who are the vendors? Who's adding the vendors into the into the into the general ledger? And what oversight do we have in terms of who has been, um, you know, who, who these vendors are and 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 the controls associated with them? Number two is when payments when payments are being made, right? What are the segregation of duties, dual authority controls that you have in place? And why is it that the board of the Boston Center of Adult Education was in some way, shape, or form not involved? You know, in the um, in the uh, I mean, hey, listen, there's lots of CFOs, not lots of there are some CFOs that are bad actors, right? And you know, in those situations, what we need to do is to this make sure that there's another control in place. Now, if you've got like organization through and through completely corrupt, that's a different story, right? We know about the Enrons of the world, you know, but that's not that common, and that's where we come back to what you were saying, which is monitoring audits. These are really important, right? Well, and who knows? Well, you know, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, BC. I was just thinking also, if you're thinking about the, the board of directors here, 
You've got your executive director who is highly unlikely handling any of the, the bookkeeping, but you never know. But the bank statements, copies of those bank statements and, and credit card statements or whatever, whatever types of financial instruments they have, the board, someone on the board, the treasurer of the board, you've got the treasurer of the board who's signing off on, yes, Joyce, who should be adding vendors to the system? Who has permission to add vendors? Who has permissions to add payroll employees? But you've got somebody who's, no one's watching the bank. They're not, someone is not looking at the bank statements. Now, you think about a nonprofit organization, these people are all volunteers, the people on the board. And you, you think I got time to spend three hours a month in during my busy world to go ahead and look at those bank statements? Well, at the end of the day, that's where it's so important when you're having people on the board that really can put the time in that is necessary for oversight, right? And so you, at the end of the day, and either external, you have somebody external outside of the organization entirely, maybe somebody that's preparing the tax return or if they're required to have an audit or not, that stuff should be picked up. How is that totally possible, right? Exactly. So if you think, yes, and agree, Tanya, the people who are signing off, people are in roles they don't know what they signed up for. And that's where I think the failure happens at that board level of, hey, you want to be the treasurer? Here's what you're responsible for. Here are all the things that need to happen. So this, the nonprofit organizations are a whole nother ball game because now you're dealing with people, not these people, these people are being paid because they were employees, but the board of directors are not. So you've got to make sure your nonprofit organizations have people in place that number one, are treasurers that understand how to read a bank statement or understand the importance of, you know, nowadays they don't give you copies of, remember back in the day when they would give you the copies of the checks, whole different ball game. They barely don't, I have clients, we don't, we have to go on into their bank account. We have to have them go in and download copies of the checks because the banks don't provide them anymore in the bank statement. And they're just like, ah, oh, that's just how the banks work. No, that's not how the banks work. You require the bank to provide you copies of the checks, period. You may have to pay for it. But think about the price, BC. We're talking, yeah. you know, we're talking maybe 50 bucks a month or $25 a month would have been a lot cheaper than $565,000. Exactly. And I think you, you highlight the, one of the most important points here is that when we use the, the A word, audit, <laughs> you know, it's seen as this, you know, bureaucratic process. Okay, I don't know, like I gotta do an audit, you know, it happens once a year, you know, the auditor comes in, who knows whether the auditor is high quality or not. They're doing this, the sort of sampling of this check and that check. And you know what, if you're trying to avoid this, you should have your own audit controls, mm -hmm. right? And treat this as a, um, as a, the, the audit control is a control, right? That's why we have them. And 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 don't wait for one year or six months or something to do this sort of process and treat this as a checkbox. This story, uh, moving on from this, is there's another one which many people have probably heard about, but if you haven't, um, this is the, uh, the town of Dixon in Northern Illinois um, had uh, Rita Cranwell who stole $53 million from the city. The, the subtext here is it doesn't happen in one shot. It happens in small quantities over an extended period of time, right? So this is once again, the point about like rising exposure and explosive loss, um, $53 million, right? A small town, like losing that kind of money over a period of time. You can imagine once again, what an impact it had, you know, to that, to that, to that, to that town. Yeah. And um, then, I mean, and, and, that, and that's where, now, the nonprofit organization is one, right, one area. Now you've got government. Now you have people stealing tax dollars from taxpayers. Now, if you can imagine in that, sitting in that courtroom, because you're bringing in the taxpayers to, to be part of this prosecution, of course, only 20 years, I think that should be, I mean, I understand it's financial, but at the end of the day, at the government level, and we know how their systems are. You go to go to your local town hall and see, you know, when you go up there and you want to get a copy of a, a birth certificate and you've got to pay three dollars for it, and they take the cash and they write out a. It's so they're so in so many ways antiquated, and so they are so much more uh, in a situation where they're at risk, and that's just 
again, it's all about those controls. I love somebody had mentioned in the, in the comments, you know, trust, but verify. And, and, yeah. and if you read, you, I, I love to watch social media because I love to watch what people are saying. I've even seen people say, oh, you have, why do you, if you trust them, why would you need to verify it? Like you've never been stolen from Then I guess that would be my answer to you as the commenter. I would say, well, you must have never seen anyone be stolen from, and you certainly haven't yourself. Otherwise you'd have a totally different attitude about it. So uh, the other point I want to make here real quickly, and I won't dwell on it, is that, you know, the cases that often rise to the level of prosecution are usually cases that are either high profile cases where, you know, for example, the person who's involved is a high profile um, bad actor or the amount of the loss is, you know, quite high. Um, unfortunately, what we have is, you know, many, 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 many cases which simply go by the wayside. They don't get prosecuted. And effectively, what ends up happening is that these bad actors, you know, essentially go from pillar to post, you know, repeating their their schemes over and over and over again. Again, it's back to what you said, is that it's up to us at some level to ensure that we have the awareness and we have the controls in place to mitigate uh, these bad things. I mean, the analogy, once again, is that, you know, look, I will plead guilty to driving above the speed limit from time to time, um, you know, but, um, you know, the, the, the people that get caught are the ones that doing are doing 110 in a 50 mile per hour zone, right? If you're doing 55, you're probably not going to get caught. And that's kind of the analogy here is that like the big crimes get caught and prosecuted. Uh, but once again, we can't really depend upon law enforcement to catch all the bad people. It's really up to us. And I love Jane. Jane has some great comments in, in the chat over here. And, and she mentioned churches. And again, 100% people are are trusting. I've seen, I've, I've read some articles and seen some stories where, you know, you've got somebody who's the treasurer of the church. They're handling all the money. Nobody else wants to do it. So she does it. She gets caught. She leaves that church and goes to the next church because one church doesn't call another say, hey, was this person trustworthy? They don't do that. And then you end up seeing, um, you know, you end up seeing these types of things they're, and they're repeat offenders. And it's it's just, that's just a whole nother thing. And there obviously there's a lot of cash when you're, when you're, you know, on a Sunday morning, man. And if you don't have two, three people, that's your number one thing. How many people count our cash at the end? Well, it's just the church. She goes up and she does it. You know, everybody else wants to be in the service, you know, but no, they're not. You got to have th minimum of three, minimum of three people counting cash. Let's move, uh, keep going, right? So this yeah. this one is, I think, uh, uh, mostly so far we've dealt with sort of you know cases involving embezzlement, internal fraud, people in the positions of power and 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 access, you know, doing mm -hmm. bad things. Um, th there are many, many, many examples of this. I just wanted to highlight this for a couple of reasons. This is the case of Mark Patterson. There's a construction company called Patco Construction up in Maine. This is a few years old, but it doesn't really matter because I think that you know we see these kinds of schemes still being perpetrated. Um, essentially, there was a the con artist sort of you know tricked him into sending uh, wiring money through a money mule you know to to fraudsters in some Eastern European country. Um, and you know um, it was a small bank in Maine. So he went to the bank and he said, like, you know what, uh, you shouldn't have let it happen. And the bank basically said to him, well, you know, sorry, it was your bad control. And by the way, I just want to let you know that, you know, uh, uh, the protections against electronic uh, theft um, on accounts, bank accounts only are extended to consumer accounts. Not to go too deep here, but there's a regulation called Reggae. Uh, which basically says that if you have a if you if you notice something bad on your account as a consumer, you can report that loss to the bank, and you have up to thirty days to report it. And the bank will make you whole while they investigate it. Reggie does not extend to bank uh, to business bank accounts. This is really important, right? You have twenty four hours, and within twenty four hours, if you can report it, then bank may do something. In the case of Mark Patterson, such a thing didn't happen, so he actually had to fight his case. Um, and eventually it was the goodwill of the bank that caused him to actually um, get his money back. Not not his money back, but some of the money back. Uh, so this is this is very common that, you know, business bank, to, it's important for everybody to know that business bank accounts are not protected by Reggie. Uh, and so once again, it's up to you to ensure that you have the controls in place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, another piece of that is, and, and people are making some great comments in the chat. Just thank you for chatting. I love it. I love to hear what you guys are also thinking, because at the end of the day, 
if we are not, and, and we may not have, it may not be about checks, by the way, people, you have a, you have, you may have an electronic method of paying bills. One of the other things that a lot of times people will do is they will go ahead and give their bookkeeper access to online banking. You know what? I don't have time for this. Just go pay my bills for me. Go online, just pay them right out of there. And the business owner, again, is still not looking at who is, what bills are being paid. They have no idea. And once that money's gone, you guys all know this. Once that money is gone, it's gone. Like they're not getting it to make a savings account. They're not stealing money to save it for future endeavors. They're sa they're stealing it and they're and they're spending it or getting rid of it or however they're doing it. You're not going to get it back. And so that's why even people will say, well, I just, you know, they just go online. Well, of course I don't have checks, Berlin. I don't have have uh, checks. I use, I do online banking. My bookkeeper just pays online so I can see what's going on. Okay. No, yep. not going to happen. Exactly. And, and so, so this is the point and right? I'm great comments. Thank you, everybody. It's just really awesome to hear your participation, to see your participation. Um, you know, it's, it's out there guys. I mean, I think those of you that are in the profession have, have experienced it. Um, and like, I'm, I'm so, it's so glad to see that, like, you know, some of you, many of you have the controls in place to, 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 to deal with it. I'm going to um, um, talk about Tom Miller, right? This is exactly what Mark Patterson did, right? You know, he four or five years later, after he after he complained to his bank, went to the regulator, you know, participated in articles in the New York Times, got some of his money back through goodwill of the bank. Ultimately, protected himself by buying insurance, right? Um, now, again, just remember that your cybercrime policy has limits. Your cybercrime policy assumes that you're not going to, you know, run in traffic, right? That you have some controls in place uh, to ensure that those risks are mitigated. Um, so I think that it's important to sort of, you know, really we'll, we'll, we'll try to wrap it all up in one uh, one at the end. The point is to put controls in place that that doesn't completely mitigate all of the risks, but whatever residual risks you have, you can ensure. And that's really the way in which you can sort of provide the protection that you need. Yep. Well, and I, I love this. Patrick made it just made a really great comment. Innocent people. So and somebody else had said it back a little bit further. Listen, if I'm a bookkeeper and they come to me and say, we need to set up some internal controls, they're actually protecting me from even being accused of it. So think about the people who have had to fight where there has been embezzlement. It wasn't the bookkeeper. It was someone else. The bookkeeper didn't even know maybe wasn't paying attention enough. And now they're looking like they're the guilty person. So putting those internal, if somebody's offended by a new internal control, you should be concerned. If I say to you, I'm going, I'm coming in, the bookkeeper's there, I'm like, listen, we're gonna set this internal control, we gotta do this, and they're offended, then I know we have a problem. So I I, I see that, and, and people are right. You know, you've got these HOAs, you've got all of these different organiz organization types where people are just thankful someone else is dealing with it. And they don't have to. And yeah. so that's just something to just keep at the top of your mind. But yes, fraud insurance. It's like we were saying earlier, I'd rather be proactive than reactive. I want to have this insurance in place in the event. Now I can sit here and say, oh, I've done everything right. I've got all my internal controls in place. You know what? There's always a way, it seems like. So you've got to be protecting yourself against it and making sure you're protecting business owners too. And it, it brings me back to the point about like the cost of control, right? I mean, really the point is that, you know, fraud insurance, uh, cybercrime insurance is money out the door, right? It's costly. Um, but once again, you know, it sort of, you know, really protects you from, you know, from the downside uh, of, of bad things happening. Let me switch gears, right? Many of you may not, most of what we've been talking about here is embezzlement and account takeover. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, but I wanted to, um, when I was running my fraud detection company, uh, I became aware of this like, you know, incredible scheme uh, called first party credit card bust out. I mean, it is so creative that I thought that it would be good to just really spend a minute to just really talk about how uh, how this scheme actually works. At the end of the day, you might not... Um, you might more unw uh, unwittingly be participating in such a scheme, unlikely, but I'll just tell you like how it works. Essentially, the way it works is that you get a group of uh, bad guys that, um, you know, nurture other people, you know, into their scheme, right? So it might be, um, let's say, I I'll, I'll give you an example, actual example of a scheme that I sort of, you know, was, um, uh, had the, you know, opportunity to learn more about. 
um, students in universities, foreign students in universities, right? Um, so basically what these guys would do is to go out to these people and they say, you know what, for, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month, what I want to do is to just really borrow your identity, right? So um, I'm going to borrow the person's identity, have him or her fill out a credit card application, uh, and now like, you know, essentially control that credit card, right? And slowly nurture how the expenses are, uh, are put on that credit card, you know? So basically now I, I kind of create a a portfolio of credit cards. Let's say in this particular case, it was a combination of fake identities and real identities um, uh, amounting to about 7,000. But even like, you know, a portfolio of two or 300 credit cards uh, can be very meaningful to a scheme like this. So you may well say, I've got the credit card, but you know, I'm not, am I not actually spending? Well, the other side of it is that I create fake merchants. Um, so basically I have a credit card, I have a fake merchant, uh, you know, credit cards are from bank ABC and the merchant uh, account is at bank DENF. So for the cost of interchange, effectively about 3% or so, what I'm doing is essentially charging these cards on the, at these merchants. And then as I pay off the bills, um, you know, I go back to the banks that are issuing the cards and say, I want to increase my credit limit. And so over the course of like a year or two, uh, this portfolio of cards really builds up a massive credit limit. In this particular case, for example, you can see 7,000 fake identities. Let's say that each one of them was $10,000 in credit. You have a, you have a, you have a $700,000 in credit that's been built up over you know, an entire sort of portfolio of cards. All that is carefully nurtured. And eventually what happens is, is a bust out. And the bust out essentially is that the same group of people that control the cards will go in and um, and and charge those cards, right? In the course of a very short period of time, fensible goods, jewelry, electronics, uh, cash advances, right? All of that basically, you know, comes out of these cards and that's it. They just disappear. Very, very difficult to detect because they all look like small frauds um, across a whole bunch of cards, across a whole bunch of banks. So I just wanted to share that with you because it's it's incredible how creative people are. Get creative. So um, finally, I just wanted to share one more thing. I think there's many people here that you know are very familiar with the fact that you know maybe you are at banks as well. A couple of things I just want to share, um, you know, is um, you know that uh, of course you know banks are not immune to issues of internal fraud, and and the question is you know what if the fox is already in the hen house? And this is not an advertising for for a book that I wrote, but, you know, but it is, um, you know, it, it's actually not available. So don't try to order it. Uh, but, the, but the point is that there's so many schemes that, you know, I, I felt like, you know, it, it was just important to kind of just really highlight the fact that bank fraud is a real deal. Bank internal fraud is a real deal. Uh, there are there are there are people that work at banks that have access to systems. They have access to, um, you know, um, being able to you know break out of uh, of account, make, pull money money out of accounts, and and sometimes it's the most uh, you know the, it's the quote unquote victimless crimes that often are the most insidious, right? Um, I was. Um, you know, one of the schemes that I became aware of was this two things that I'll tell you, right? One is that, you know, you have like, for example, a bank teller that sits down at lunchtime looking up hundreds of identities, thousands of identities in zip codes that are, you know, quote unquote, you know, um, high net worth zip codes. It's quote unquote a victimless crime, right? Because no money is lost. But all of those identities are essentially used in other schemes elsewhere. For example, in a um, you know in a bust out scheme. Uh, and I think that uh, that access can be really, really you know difficult to sort of control. So. Um, and the same thing, right? The other point I want to make is that often it's the case that, you know, these things have to rise to a certain level of loss before they're actually, um, you know, prosecuted. Uh, and one of the sad things, of course, is that, you know, the small losses um, may be caught and the bank employees may be terminated, um, but it's not uncommon for the same bank employee uh, to go down the street to a different bank um, because there's no record, so to speak, of this crime being committed because, quote unquote, no crime. It was just a termination. And the industry is working on like, you know, common databases and so forth. You know, people like early warning services do provide some kinds of controls, but it's not consistent and nobody, nobody sort of, you know, systematically does it. So 
you know, while we are often, you know, we're here to talk about like payments related fraud, financial fraud, uh, there are things that we control, but there are things that we don't control. So it's very important, again, to become aware of like, you know, banks that, you know, maybe, um, you know, talk to your banker, right, to find out like, you know, what controls they have in place. You know, I love there's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Devin. Sorry, Don, I'm just going to interrupt for a moment just to let everyone know that the third poll did end. Nearly 60% of attendees, actually over 60% of attendees, have experienced fraud within their clients or their own businesses. So um, thanks for answering that and just letting you know that the fourth poll is launched. It's a multiple choice answer. So we'll leave this up for the duration of the session. Thank you. I just, I, there's some great, uh, there's a ton of great comments in the in the chat, really awesome. One of them that I wanted to point out, a couple of people had said it about forcing vacation. Now, and some people say, well, you know, we've got, we got to have cost benefit. I'm that, I totally get that. I understand the cost benefit of implementing these controls. That control is free. That is a really important one. If you have somebody who never wants to leave the office or <clears throat> someone who's always working late, they're always the last one out of the office. That can be an, another indicator that something is amiss. You know, you know they have two or three kids, and they're at, you're still at the office at nine, right? So, we know that there are some indicators that we can watch and and keep our eye on. But that's definitely one that I think is important. Is to, everyone should be taking vacation, and so if people are not taking, oh yeah, I just like to accumulate it. So at one point I can take three months off. That's not a thing, by the way. No yeah. business could afford for someone to take three months off. Highly unlikely, especially if they're involved in the financials in any capacity. So it's just so interesting um, about that, what happens there. And I love uh, Richard, Richard, 100%. Revenue fraud can be more difficult to detect, which is totally possible. There are, uh, there are occasions, which is why no one should ever be using checks anyway. People are still stealing checks out of a mailbox, people. And you know what? They take that check and you know what they can do with that? They can create more checks from that. You know, there's a lot of, you know, just go on to, you know, checks for less and go up there and you could just take that routing and account number and go ahead and put a whole different address on it and send it to you and you can be spending money like crazy. You don't even have to be in the business. Physical checks, there's absolutely no reason for physical checks. And I think the worst culprits of those are the attorneys. That's just my opinion. I have an attorney that I work with and I'm like, I'm not mailing you a check. I don't have them. We're not doing that. So you can wait the two weeks for what, you know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't do it that way. We do everything with electronic uh, uh, systems in place, but, but it is so revenue accounting absolutely can be so complicated. So I just wanted to kind of make a point on that. Check fraud is still the biggest form of fraud. We talk all day long about business email compromise, electronic payment fraud. Um, the ABA, the American Bankers Association publishes, um, you know, fraud statistics. Uh, check fraud is still the single biggest form of fraud. I know some of some of you in the comments have talked about like positive pay, um, which is a uh, a way for you to create a list of checks that you have issued on any given day, send it to the bank, and then the bank essentially has is a control mechanism to prevent uh, bad checks that don't match up the positive pay ledger from being paid. It's a great control. Not every bank offers it, and it's extremely tedious to handle. Right? I mean, you know, I think the same thing with ACH um, positive pay. Similarly. Um, you know, you have to have debit blocks on your account. You really should. If you don't have a de ACH debit block on your account, do it today, yes. right? Um, you know, I think it's really, really important, basic stuff that people often, you know, ignore. Um, well, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Ahead, I just want to, Thomas has, I mean, could, I'm telling you, I could talk about this for days, but uh, Thomas has made a couple of great comments about emails. So I had that happen. I had I had a client where an email came in that the boss was out of town. You know why the pe the person knew the boss was out of town? Because they put it on Facebook. So they see that the CEO is on Facebook out of out of the country. Now they got to go to their LinkedIn profile, get their email address, make a copy mocking of it, and they're sending emails. And people are doing it. People are wiring money wherever this particular person is in the world. And they're doing that. So you've got, and they, they're they really good with the email. They can make an, you know, they, they just, they just maybe relocate a dot somewhere or put an initial in or take an initial out of the email address and voila, wires are going out because you know why the bookkeeper's freaking out because the, they don't take the time to call the boss. Hey, did you send me this email? They're like, the boss needs a hundred grand. Let's get them the hundred grand because they're out in Italy doing whatever. It's like, what? 
Um, and so, you know, just eliminating checks doesn't solve all the problems, but boy, we have to stay ahead of it. We've got to take those preventive measures. We've got to get that insurance. So we have it, we're good. And we, and we just, we have to be smarter and smarter and smarter as we move forward. You know, it's funny because um, two things I'll say is that we actually had that happen. We didn't fall victim to it, but we did have that happen at my last company. My CFO um, texted me one day and said, yeah, I've teed up the payment. Can you please approve it? I'm like, what payment are you talking about? You know, <laughs> and then right. he sent me this like long email email trail that is between him and me, right? And like, you know, it starts out with me sending Bill an email saying that, hey, Bill, uh, you know, I need you to urgently send $21,000 to this account. Um, I'll tell you about it later, right? And then Bill says, okay, are you sure? Who is it for? I said, yeah, 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 I'm really busy. You know, I'll tell you about it later. Uh, okay, sounds good. Can you give me the details of where it should be sent? Well, here's the routing number. Here's the account number where the money should be sent. And Bill, of course, you know, he teased it up. We had dual authority, segregation of duties, controls in place that prevented, you know, that required, you know, every payment to go through this sort of, you know, uh, uh, authorization. And so that's really, at the end of the day, what caught it. You know, if Bill had full control and full power about being able to dis disperse that money, it would have been, would have been gone. And, yeah. you know, because it came out of a bank account, a business bank account, you know, subject does not subject to reggae, we would have had to fight with our bank to get the money back. They would not have given it. And why would they? It's not their problem. I'm very sympathetic to banks that, you know, seem to get hit on the head by people who are not, have, don't have good controls in place. Um, you know, and, 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 it's, and, and I think, I don't know, I think we're sort of, as you said, we can go forever on this, but I think we're kind of close to. Uh, you know, the end of the hour. So what I wanted to do is to generally spend a couple of minutes to ask this question, what controls do you have in place? And I really want to start by doing fraud math. You mentioned this, uh, Don, you know, there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no perfect solution. But what we can do is to put in place sequential controls that mitigate the risk. And so please bear with me while I take us through this. Imagine that, you know, the latent probability of fraud in any particular scheme was X, right? And imagine that you had a control in place, whatever it was, that made it, you know, somewhat effective, 50% effective. The control was 50% effective, which means that with that control in place, you've reduced the fraud probability by half. So um, by 0.5X. Now imagine that you had another control in place that mitigated that risk, right? And let's say that that was 50% effective. Now you've further reduce that probability by half. So you started out by X, now you have quarter X, right? And in this way, if you kind of really string together a sequence of controls, and it's really important for you to understand the full flow and all of the controls so that you can sort of feel confident that you more or less addressed all of the issues. And like I said, you're never gonna address it completely. There are always new schemes, but my experience and Don, I think this is your experience and just about everybody on this call probably would agree that it often comes down to just a handful of things that mitigate that risk. And what I'd like to say is that once you've put the controls in place, you've mitigated all of those risks, ensure the residual risk, right? Just purchase some insurance so that you now know that you know in the worst case scenario where you've got some really bad thing happen uh, that you know it can be insured. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's so true. Tone at the top, people are making comments and and I and I appreciate um Nan's comment about, you know, we're we're always talking about bookkeepers. Like the bookkeepers are stealing stuff like crazy. That's not the case at all and that's certainly I agree 100%. It is not at all in my opinion that it's it's a minority of people who are doing it. What ends up happening is you know, we we focus in on bookkeepers because so many bookkeepers have access to financial means for companies, but that certainly doesn't mean that I think all book, you know, that bookkeepers in as a general sense are thieves, you know, in any any capacity. But um, I know just at the end of the day, the way I look at this is how can we protect the client? How can we protect the business owner? How can we protect the employees? I want to protect that bookkeeper. I don't know at any one shape, any any one point, what financial position that person may be in, or whatever, or an executive director. We looked at an executive director and a marketing person. It wasn't even two people who had nothing to do with the accounting area. How did they do that? And so, as we're looking at it, for sure, tone at the top, 
moon in the middle, buzz at the bottom, Anthony. I love that. That's a great saying. And it's so true. And we want to trust people. We want to, and like we said in the beginning, BC, you said in the beginning, trust is like the most important component in human nature. We trust people. We want to trust people. And so in order to sustain that ability of trust, sometimes we just have to make sure that we still have these systems in place to minimize the risk. And I, and I agree a hundred percent. Ashton, you got some great comments in there too. So, um, you know, it, it is, we're just being able to do it. So yes, go right ahead here, BC. This is a good, yeah. So I think the point I want to make is that, you know, when it comes to AP, right, which is where some of the greatest areas of risk lie. Uh, this is my point about like stringing together a sequence of controls. Now, please understand that every control creates friction in process. Um, and, and it's always tempting to say, like, remove this control because it's irritating, you know, but the reality is the moment you remove the control, um, you're creating risk. True story. Without naming the customer, I'll tell you this week, last week, we had a customer come to us and say, you know what? I want to do auto payments. Well, what does that mean? It means that as soon as I put the invoice in, I want the payment to go out. Really? This is what you want. You know, it's just like it takes too much time. I have too many payments, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I just want it to go out. This is a really bad idea, right? <laughs> and so, and so anyway, the, the 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 point of this is, you know, whatever system you use, and I'm I'm really using our own accounts payable solution of which, you know, again, I, 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 my job description, description is to be a shill for my own company. So, you know, uh, please bear with me while I do this. But we do have an accounts payable automation system. We care very deeply about making sure that the controls are in place to ensure that you are able to mitigate that risk. It starts with, you know, what are you using for two-factor authentication, right? It's tempting to say it's irritating. I don't want to wait for that sort of second factor to come to my cell phone, you know, blah, blah, blah. Who's going to pay for the SMS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it starts there. Authentication, authorization. What, what role do you play? What controls do you have in place? Are you allowed to do X when your job is Y? What do you have the kind of fine grain control associated with the process? Mm -hmm. People often don't think about invoice capture and invoice approval as a control mechanism, but that's what it is, right? Fake invoices come in, duplicate invoices come in. Um, and like, you know, I get invoices from some random company that wants to bill me $5,000 for some poster that, you know, supposedly relates to some patent that I just got. What? You know, and if this was not approved by somebody that was responsible for that expense, then guess what? I would have paid it out. Is that fraud? Sure. It's not a financial internal embezzlement. It's not business email compromise, but it is invoice fraud. You know, we didn't really talk about invoice fraud today. There's a massive amount of that that goes on. So invoice capture, invoice approval, really important. Many of you have purchase orders, super important to ensure that the invoice approvals are, you know, um, are, are properly addressed. And then we talk about like payment approval, right? Which is another control. Most of the conversation tends to revolve around like, you know, dual authority and segregation of duties. That's important. Even then what slips through is needs to be monitored from a transaction standpoint. Yeah, everything went through, but why are we paying these suppliers, you know, more often than they should be paid, right? Um, what is it that's happening about this particular payment where like the first payment to a supplier after an address change, that's suspicious, or at least a control that should be in place. You know, these are things that, you know, every system should have in place. And then finally, of course, the bank has their own controls in place. But in general, I think that, you know, my point is that every one of these controls mitigates the risk and the sequential controls in the end, the probability of um, overall risk being mitigated is significant. Um, and, and that's really, you know, all I wanted to say uh, about this. Perfect. Where it looks like we're finishing right on time, BC. Yeah, so did a great. Questions. Let's see. I'm not sure if we have a ton of time in questions. I know you guys did a really great job of answering questions while we were going throughout the webinar. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, I do just want to take control of you very shortly and just let everyone know that if you are interested in what BC was chatting about, about AP automation and really how to mitigate fraud with that, you're more than welcome to schedule a demo with us at Santine, santine.com slash demo. Um, I just want to thank everyone for really being so engaging in this conversation. It was really fun to see the chats going back and forth and especially Don and BC for you guys and bringing all of your knowledge to the table today and sharing these stories with everyone attending.
Thank you, everybody. Thank it was great. I love the so. chat. Thank you for participating. That makes it so much better. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Ron. Enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Y'all take Thank care. Thank you, now. everyone. Have a great Bye -bye. day. Bye. Bye.